you did all the study for the written, you've got the Viva. Yeah, I've had a prolonged period of enjoying life. Ah, uh, yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, and now I'm back. But um, yeah. yeah, I've been a bit slow, a bit slow for this uh, to get going. So I've not had many vivas, and yeah, okay. uh, I've had a lot of advice about what to do. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's really productive. <laughs> like I went to your uh, obviously went to your boot camp, uh, yeah. and I've been going to the ASA ones, and obviously the ones at work. Yeah, good, so, good. Um, I guess at the moment I feel a bit overwhelmed with technique. Yeah, okay. And, and like I just need to have a go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, like there's, I'm there's... Pretty early in this, pretty early in the piece at the moment. Yeah. There's nothing. Um, like yeah, like you know, you examine you ten different consultants will have a different approach to something, and all they've got is the thing that they pass the exam. And that's all that you know we've really got. But then even when you look at examiners, they all have their own biases as well. So. It's yeah. At a certain point, that's saturated, and there's no point learning any more technique. Just, 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 just do, do it. it. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, thanks for you know, thanks for letting me record and podcast this. It, it it really is useful. Like the amount of feedback I get from people who listen to this kind of stuff and say, oh yeah, that's that's what's really useful. Is, yeah, is I'm great. like, but, yeah, I'm putting myself out there just in the name <laughs> of getting more back of practice. And I'm just like, oh my god, I'm regretting this already. Currency, right? Like. <laughs> I, I, I need you to be on YouTube and you need Viva. It's like, yeah, I know. I know. It's, so, it's very transactional, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it has got to that point where now I, I, I've only got time to give Vivas if it's also for the education of other people. That's, yeah. That, that yeah. just makes sense anyway. Well, so it doesn't matter how bad I am, does it? Because it's about... Um, Yeah. Um, Hang on, my computer just come unplugged. I'm just gonna do it. Yeah, please do. Um, I just don't want it to. Do anything bad halfway through? Um, oh fuck! Oh well, we've got. I've got eighty percent. It should be enough. Yeah, good. That that should definitely be enough. Yeah. Hey, so what I, what I'll do is um yeah. So I'll just do a bit bit of an introduction to what this is, and I'll say you know, hey Joe, just tell us a bit about yourself, and you know, you can just say where you're at in training, and you know, maybe yeah. what are the what are the difficulties of this exam. Maybe you can have a chat about the opinions and yeah. you know, technique okay. and stuff. And that's useful. Uh, and then I'll just go through the exam for, you know, around 40 minutes or so. Um, what I found pretty useful is a pause and discuss. So I might ask a question and then you'll give an answer and, and whatever answer you'll give, I'll maybe reiterate it, add some things, but don't, uh, so hopefully that's not too stop start. Uh, I know that's uh, good. Cause I was thinking it was just going to be one continuous thing. <laughs> and so. I, I'll, I'll try to make it as much of a discussion. Like there's some things that will be, you know, like most exams, there'll be some things that are just totally just, opinion based and we can have a discussion maybe about what practice that we've seen in the, in you know you know thing to make it as conversational and as you know okay. less examining as possible okay so it's not super formal no yeah. not at all no no yeah okay good good <laughs> good okay so i might get started yeah hi everyone and welcome to abc's of anesthesia and this is not a special episode so essentially we're going to do an exam i've got joe on the other end here who's zooming in and so i'm pretty much just going to quiz her i'm going to have a discussion about this topic uh, and we're going to put this out on our podcast, ABCs and Anesthesia, as well as the YouTube channel. So hopefully it's really useful for people to get some good knowledge and also get some good exam technique for this um, ANSCA part two exam. Uh, so Joe, thanks so much for, you know, volunteering for this and being another guinea pig, I guess. You're welcome. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and yeah, some of the hurdles you've had. Uh, so I'm a fourth year trainee. I've started my training in the UK and I moved over here to Australia. Welcome to the um, promised land. Thank you. I've um, I've sat my UK final exam a few years ago now, um, but obviously this one has got a slightly different format, and so I guess I'm at the stage of trying to learn the nuances of of the Australian final. Mm, okay, excellent. And uh, just in our chats previously, you were saying you, you've um, been taking a lot of technique advice on board. Um, yeah, what do you make yeah. of that? I feel sort of somewhat saturated with advice about technique at the moment. And um, I think it, I just need to get out there and practice. 
Yeah, that's right. I, and I, it's one of those things where every, you know, 10, 100 different consultants, let's say, will have 100 different techniques for something. And even examiners will have their own biases. So, you know, at, at a certain point, you know, you will pass this exam as well. And then you'll have your own technique, which you'll be given advice yeah. on. So at a certain point, yeah, saturation is probably the right thing. You just need to get lots of good knowledge out there and uh, in a succinct fashion, I think. Good. Well, let's get started. So what I'll do, I'll give you a STEM. You are in a regional hospital, which uh, let's say six theaters and an ICU. Uh, you are called to assess a four-week-old boy with projectile vomiting. What are your differentials? So I'll give you, you know, one to two minutes of kind of writing that STEM out. And at the end of that, I might actually ask you what you've written for that STEM. Yeah, so just quickly, this is kind of informal. So what, what did you write down in that two minutes of prep time before yeah, so I uh, summarised the case, a regional hospital, age, gender and predominant symptom of vomiting. Um, I've then written down an estimated weight of, I, I just guess, three and a half kilos. I've written endotracheal tube, LMA, fluid at 10 per kilo. Um, and then I also wrote down adrenaline, atropine and sucks. Um, and then a list of differentials. I've pretty much got ETT size and depth cuffed uncuffed as well did, did yeah you know perhaps should have gone for depth actually that might be something that i'll add in mm. uh, yeah, but so I've, I've, got, just gone, I've just gone three and a half cuffed yeah good good so i actually got two and a half cuffed and three three uncuffed it's not too different i guess yeah, you'd okay. yeah um, i'm a bit big yeah and then nine centimeters of depth uh good good i, I like your summary as well you're you know trying to hit the high points of what you might find in this case I've just said here a neonate with possible diagnosis, which is a medical emergency, uh, need yep. assistance, et cetera, transfer PED center, appropriate monitoring post-op, continuous pulse ox and apnea monitoring maybe. Anyway, so what are, you, what are your differentials? My primary differential would be that of pyloric stenosis. Uh, mm -hmm. My alternative differentials would be uh, gastroenteritis, mm -hmm. severe reflux disease, mm -hmm. um, a bowel obstruction, mm -hmm potentially secondary to something like intersusception or the just been generalized sepsis. Fantastic. That's exactly what I've, I've noted here as well. Um, so pyloric stenosis, what, what is pyloric stenosis? Uh, this is hypertrophy of the pyloric sphincter um, leading to gastric outflow obstruction. And mm -hmm. uh, this results in um, severe uh, projectile vomiting um, and development of a um, severe electrolyte derangement and metabolic alkalosis, which is a Excellent. medical emergency. Excellent. What, so what electrolytes are lost and what is this uh, resulting electrolyte and acid-based profile? Due to loss of stomach acid, the, there will be loss of uh, hydrogen chloride mm -hmm. significantly um, and loss of potassium. Mm -hmm. um, this results in a severe metabolic alkalosis with hypokalemia. Beautiful. I've got here like hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic al al alkalosis. That's often the it's cliche. Nice that's said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've not looked at this up for a while. Yeah. And, the, and I always find this one a bit tricky because then often the next question was, you know, why, why do you get such a, you know, a terrible hypokalemia in this circumstance? This is, this is not just vomiting gastric fluid. No, it's to do with the renal compensation, I think. Oh, God. No, no, that's, that's right. So the kidneys are trying to retain, the kidneys are trying to retain hydrogen ions. Exactly. Uh, kind of. You've got dehydration, so you've got yeah. loss, and then you get increased aldosterone because you're trying to keep on holding okay. water, and, uh, water and salt. Yeah. And that means that when you do that, you will lose more potassium because you're trying to preference volume and salt and you can't avoid losing potassium with that, with that pump system. But how about, so that's the, I guess that's the next reason. That's two reasons. And the third reason, so first reason, vomiting potassium, second reason, aldosterone effects. And the third reason, what happens when you've got uh, alkalosis, you know, in, in the bloodstream, where, where, where do the shifts occur? So as in you've got, would you have uh, intracellular potassium? Yeah, exactly. Why would that shift to intracellular? To balance out the loss of hydrogen ions. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's always like H plus and K move in opposite directions. Well, yeah. You're trying to, body's trying to defend the, acid, the pH so that it's moving H plus out, K goes in, hyperkalemia results. 
So that means you've still got the potassium, but it's in it's it's yeah. a relative, almost it's, relative hypokalemia. Yeah, so you're still losing total body potassium, but now the extracellular potassium is going intracellular. Sure. So, yeah, so it will, and, and that's where the effect of it is anyway. So why what? What does this acid-base profile do to ventilation? Obviously very important in these um, neonates. So the overall, um, the overall pH of the blood is, is alkalotic. And therefore the, um, in compensation, you'll develop a, a compensatory respiratory acidosis. And therefore I would think that the respiration rate will be sort of slower than one might anticipate. Exactly. And slower meaning you'll have a depressant effect. So now what condition are you worried about post-operatively? So um, the patient may develop sort of um, respiratory depression and, and um, reduced conscious level. Yeah, so respiratory yeah. depression and, and specifically in this, you know, every neonate might be at risk of this. Oh, sorry, apneas, apneas. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And here's one of the things, anytime I think of neonate, I just think, oh yeah, post apneas, apneas. I'm worried yeah. about that. And especially in these in these young, young kids. That's probably worth writing in the introduction, in your little reminder at the... Uh, exactly, yeah. Because the there's probably a few bundles. Like, I talk about this concept of bundles, you know, as soon as I think neonate... I think of a few things and one of those is post-op apnea but pediatric center transfers and then things more specific to the problem, but that's good. So this is always a tricky one, but not, not many of us have worked in, you know, pediatric centers for that long to see pyloric stenosis, uh, but how would you resuscitate this patient besides carefully? <laughs> um, so the priorities of resuscitation are to reestablish volume status um, and correction of um, electrolytes, mm -hmm. as well as the basics, such as maintaining baby's temperature mm -hmm. um, and avoiding aspiration where possible. That's great. Um, I like that you categorize those because now you can talk in detail about volume, electrolytes, and others. Go for it. With regards to volume status, I would res uh, initially commence resuscitation with um, 10 mils per kilo of um, normal saline. Now, are you sure? Yes. Good. You, the reason I asked, are you sure in that situation when you were correct was that you sounded unsure. Yeah. In well. inflection, right? Uh, so generally for the, for the viewers and listeners, like we you know, often the examiner asks, are you sure? It's because you may have had a lapse in your judgment. You may have just said some error, but the way Jo just did then, she, she looked like she was unsure. So I had to clarify. <laughs> anyway, she was. Can I clarify? Can the viewers see my face? Uh, I haven't, I haven't edited it yet, but yeah, they, they, I, can, I can make them not see your face if you'd like. Oh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I've tried to do poker face, but I don't think it worked. <laughs> that one didn't. <laughs> Just definitely not sure about that. But yeah, normal saline sounds good. Uh, um, resuscitating, um, I, the aim would be to resuscitate the baby back to um, a urine output of one to two mils per kilogram. Fantastic. That's a good end point. Um, along going. with electrolyte replacement. Fantastic. Do you give glucose at all? This baby um, will will need some background glucose in order to avoid hypoglycemia. Right. How do you give? But that? I wouldn't be using it as a resuscitation fluid. Sounds good. So, um, I would run um, a background infusion of ten percent glucose, mm -hmm. but I would have to seek local guidance regarding the the, vo the volumes per kilo with that. That sounds reasonable. How much now? Whenever I think of fluid management, I th do you have a framework for fluid management? Um, so we've got sort of, we've got resuscitation fluid yep. and maintenance fluid and then ongoing losses. So I suppose there's sort of three. The Fantastic. Three. So ideal, ideally with that answer, you'd say I'd resus with, you know, 10 to 20 mils per kilo of normal saline. My maintenance would be this and my ongoing losses I'd replace with this. So uh, tell me about maintenance fluid then. Um, so maintenance fluid would be replaced in a, a four to one regime. So four mils per kilo for the first 10 kilos, two mils per kilo for the second 10 kilos and one mil per kilo thereafter. Great. So let's say this child is five kilos. How much would you give? Uh, so it's four by five is 20 mils an hour. Perfect. 20 mils per hour of normal saline. And you'd add. The and then add the ongoing losses, which would be sort of weighed and measured. Now how do you add potassium? Obviously a pretty advanced question. How would you add that? I'm not sure. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I'm, this is a really great guideline just to let the audience know the Royal Children's Hospital has amazing clinical practice guidelines. I'll put a link 
uh, in the description below. Uh, but essentially, they talk about adding K or potassium once urine output achieves one to two mils per kilo per hour. And then, you know, the practical stuff, like how do you keep measuring this? So, you know, arterial gas is six hourly and you want to aim to correct slowly over for the next 48 hours. So giving all of this information in the context of I would resuscitate fluids, electrolytes, and others. Fluid is resuscitation, maintenance, and ongoing losses with this, this and this method that we've mentioned, and then replacing uh, potassium once adequate urine output and baby's resuscitated, measuring six hourly, aim to correct in 48 hours. That's, that feels like a complete answer. Um, so, I mean, that said, now the practicalities of this is when can surgery commence? Obviously, baby needs surgery. When can surgery commence? Um, it can commence when the baby is adequately uh, fluid resuscitated, i.e. when blood pressure, heart rate parameters are within normal limits and the urine output has achieved one to two mils per kilogram per hour. Yes. Um, with sort of um, correction of all other electrolytes and acid base status. Yeah, that's fair. Excellent. I've got the actual values for the electrolyte uh, replacement values, but essentially they're just norm normal values. Roughly normal is, yeah. is what you want. Um, okay, good. Now, how do you do this induction, by the way? Like, how do you do this uh, anesthetic? So th this child is, um, is obviously at risk of aspiration, um, given that they have pyloric stenosis. Um, this could be, the, the risk of aspiration could be reduced um, through by insertion of an, an NG tube. Um, I haven't seen one myself, but I understand there's some sort of specialized NG tube that can be used to sort of suction all four quadrants of the stomach. Um, yeah, yeah. Empty it, it, the stomach. yeah, I've just got to get an NGT, so it may be the reason. This child will have IV access by virtue of the fact that they've been um, sort of resuscitated, and therefore I would undertake a um, a rapid sequence induction um, following parental consent and adequate ANSCA monitoring with a trained assistant. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Would you do this yourself? Uh, absolutely not. Um, so um, as a neonate, I would want a second pair of um, second pair of hands available. Yeah, sounds good. Would you want a pediatric anesthetist or? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. good. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because that, that ANSCA, the new ANSCA document on PEDS does state what age we, as a fanska, you should be allowed to, and what, what age is that? Uh, so it's, I believe that's two years and above. Yeah, exactly. Which is quite nice because a lot of us who, you know, become, you know, graduate as consultants, often we don't work with neonates anymore. That's a very, very specialized pediatric area. And uh, yeah, having a second pair of hands for that would be absolutely, absolutely vital. So let's say the patient's resuscitated and transferred for an uneventful surgery, everything goes well. Now the child presents at six months of age. So next, next problem, as you can see, I'm trying to pack in as many problems that are pediatrically oriented as possible. So child presents at six months with a small hernia from the lap ports for this operation. Now, what is your pediatric assessment of the six month old? My, my uh, pediatric assessment would have obviously involved uh, assessing the child in the presence of, of a parent or carer. Mm -hmm. um, it would involve a sort of a standard anesthetic assessment, including um, past medical history, including any um, congenital conditions, uh, past anesthetic history, uh, irregular medications, allergies, um, family history of anesthetic issues. Um, also fasting status, if, if it's immediately preoperatively and um, history regarding any recent um, viral upper respiratory tract infections. Um, I would also include immunizations and development, development history. Um, as part of my pre-op assessment, I would also um, try to develop a rapport with the child and um, assess, assess the child's airway for any gross sort of airway abnormalities or any obvious difficulties, as well as having a quick look for um, IV, potential IV access points. Anything else? Um, as, I would also consider the, uh, the preoperative assessment stage, the administration of a, of a pre-med. Um, if I felt this was necessary, this could be in the form of uh, Emla cream um, or um, a sedative pre-med if required. Anything else on assessment? Um, I'll have a little listen to the examined child very briefly. Yeah, what would you do? Listening for murmurs and uh, any evidence of respiratory infection. Fantastic, you hear a murmur. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just think about this. In, uh, 
it's not the general pattern that we listen to every chest any, anymore. I, I, I've noticed that. Yeah. And I feel like um, that's just one of those things. Once you get this on the exam, you've got to be better than your best day. So your history, examination and investigations. And you're absolutely right with everything. Yeah. Prior, prior anesthesia, family history of issues, meds, allergies, uh, any issues post-surgery, are they developing well? Um, and, you know, do, does a child act normally, feed normally? Is everything being progressing normally? And then on examination, you know, a brief airway exam, I guess, as best as you can. Um, and heart lungs, but you do find a murmur. Let's put that on hold for a second. The patients are really, sorry, the parents are really concerned about brain development and anesthesia. What do you say to them? The, stu the studies that have looked at brain development and anesthesia, um, I believe have been conducted in, in, not in humans and actually in rats and, um, and the, the, the levels of anesthetic that, those, that they were exposed to significantly higher than the, the doses of anesthetic that children um, are exposed to. So although those studies have potentially showed some impact on brain development, uh, it's not really, it, it's very difficult to translate that into practice. Um, any, the, any, any human trials? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, no, I think on balance, I think that a short a short anesthetic with a, a short, fairly low dose anesthetic in order to improve this child's um, sort of quality of life from a hernia point of view would um, sort of be more important than the, the potential negligible um, risk to, to child's development. Yeah, fair enough. Look, um, so what would make you want to wait in this child? Um, if, so if the child, if the child had um, sort of an acute respiratory viral respiratory infection or, or other or low respiratory infection for that matter, um, oh, as in regarding the brain development, uh, uh, um, presents with a hernia, when would you want to delay this child? I'm not. I'm not sure what the sort of optimal age cutoff would be i mean obviously it's elective it's it's obviously it's elective surgery it's not yep. super urgent um, but i'm not i'm not sure no that's right hey so this is good so your, your gut feeling is right which is which is really good so um the fact that you're saying that short anesthesia probably has no effect that's that's probably right so the gas trial gas um mm. so, so when i'm constructing these vibes I, I literally just go through a quick lit review find the latest evidence and just try to put this as a, a package of information so the gas trial showed that slightly less than one hour of general anesthesia in early infancy does not alter neurodevelopmental outcome at age five years compared with awake regional anesthesia in a predominantly male study population. So that's the specifics of that gas trial five-year follow-up. And that was in the Lancet. So I'll again, put the link to that. So that was GA versus regional. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So essentially these patients had these, yeah, awake regional or general anesthesia. What, slightly less than one hour in early infancy doesn't alter at five years of age. That okay. said, I did read this um, 2015 editorial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by five experts. So again, expert opinion. Um, and they strongly recommend that unless the surgery is urgently needed, anesthetic exposure should be delayed until children are three years of, or, of age or older. And that's kind of what I was getting at, really. Like, when would you delay? I'd have a chat to the surgeon. Is this urgent? Is it not urgent? If it's not urgent, we can wait. If it's a small hernia, very little, you know, bowel or other contents is getting stuck in that hernia, the child is normal otherwise, then that sounds like that's some that's a reason I could delay to three years. But hey, if it's if it's a large mass, if it's getting bowel contents in, it seems very reasonable to go ahead. So but may that, I ask, would you would you that 2015 editorial has changed? has changed your practice, would you say, with regards to timing? Yeah, I, I mean, I find, I find that the gas trial is very reassuring for short surgeries, first of all. And I think the editorial was probably what most people understand of this. If it's urgent, you do it. If it's not urgent, you don't, you, you delay. And that's, that, that's kind of the ob obvious thing of yeah. most of anesthesia. We, we avoid giving an anesthetic or surgery if it's not needed. Uh, uh, until you know things are optimized and in a child the optimization is brain development optimization so getting back to this kid at five years at five years of age now the child presents to you at pre-admission clinic for tonsillectomy assessment so this child is having a bit of a bad run with operations <laughs> and you do hear a murmur the murmur has progressed <laughs> what do you do how do you how do you uh, sort this out 
Um, so murmurs can obviously be sort of um, significant or non-significant. So I would undertake sort of history examination um, to try to ascertain further details as to whether I should be concerned about this murmur. Mm -hmm. um, features that I would be concerned about on history would be um, reduced exercise tolerance, inability to keep up with his peers, um, sort of difficulty gaining weight, um, any sort of shortness of breath, chest pains, palpitations or inability to lie flat as well as syncopal episodes. Um, but reassuring features would be sort of no limitations in any of, any of the above. Um, on examination, the particular characteristics of the murmur that would um, make me concerned were if it was uh, not an early systolic murmur, if there were any heaves or thrills, if there was any evidence of failure, and if, if it was not just a, if it did not sound like a straightforward sort of venous hum or early systolic murmur. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> and that's a tricky question, right? Because it's not something we often see. Uh, any, so any other things on history, broadly speaking, that would make you worried? So um, I guess any, any history of um, other conditions or anything that would suggest this was part of a syndrome or part Fantastic. of a sort of um, yeah, congenital other congenital conditions. Perfect. No syndromes, no other congenital abnormalities. Uh, what, what age would you be, you know, concerned about, less concerned about? So there's actual age that they recommend. So less, sure. less than one year of age, uh, you would refer all murmurs, whereas greater than one year of age. Okay. Maybe, okay. And the final thing is, you know, family history of other stuff, you know, congenital cardiac stuff. What, what particular uh, lesions are you most worried about? I'd be worried about any large shunts, so AS, significant ASD or VSD. Anything else? Um, any other as lesions? As well as um, Hockham. Yeah, absolutely, because got, it's got the congenital link. So yeah, Hockham, critical aortic stenosis are two dangerous conditions to exclude before surgery, and both are usually interestingly associated with left ventricular hypertrophy and left axis deviation on ECG. Again, I'd need a cardiologist to read a pediatric E ECG, I haven't read one of those in a while. Uh, good, good. So that's that's one of those approaches to the to the moment. And again, because you're an experienced anesthetic registrar, you know you've got a gut feeling of a lot of these things in the in the right direction. And those were just a couple, a couple of extra points. Broadly yeah. speaking, family history, no syndromes, and age greater than one is uh, yeah, age less than one needs referral. Uh, good. Let's say that pre-admission clinic's done, you find the murmur has none of the concerning features and you're happy to proceed, uh, and there's no worrying signs. So they now present two weeks later for the surgery, but like this poor kid has gone through everything, this mom, <laughs> the, um, the mom says that the child has a cold. What, what do you do? So the, um, the fact that the child has a cold means that the child is at an increased risk of sort of perioperative respiratory events, including um, laryngospasm and, and bronchospasm. Um, I would assess the child, so I would take a history and examine the child to rule out any um, concerning features of a severe infection or a, um, a bacterial infection. So I'd like to um, take a history regarding um, sort of snot or sputum production, any fevers, um, or if the child is generally unwell, as well as significant shortness of breath or respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. um, any evidence of a low respiratory tract infection would also be concerning. Okay. If this was a simple upper respiratory tract infection without systemic features of being unwell and was just sort of runny nose, a, a bit of a mild cough, um, it would then be um, a balance of risks um, as to whether we proceed or not. Ideally, I would like the child to have be sort of two weeks over a, an upper respiratory tract infection before anaesthetizing the child. Um, but on the balance of that is the time that the child will be missing up from school um, the ongoing symptoms from the primary pathology, as well as the sort of the social factors with regards to the parent being able to bring the child to hospital. Yeah, sounds good. You cover a lot of in good factors there. So now the interesting thing about this is, so let's say even if they have no systemic features, uh, they will have an increased risk of respiratory complications, which I agree with. So how is it that you're okay to go ahead if we've got an increase in respiratory complications? Um, despite the fact that there will be an increased risk of intraoperative um, events, particularly sort of laryngospasm and bronchospasm, 
Um, there, there is sort of no, as long as these are managed appropriately, which I will have sort of heightened vigilance for, there's mm -hmm. no long-term sequelae of this child Fantastic. undergoing. Uh, uh, that's, that's, I completely agree with that. So the evidence would suggest that you have, you know, what is it, uh, two to seven times increased risk of respiratory complications, desaturation, laryngospasm, coughing, breath holding, bronchospasm, uh, this increases even more with intubation, but uh, but however, there's no long-term sequelae. So you know, you, once you're confident with these cases, you can have the confidence that you'll be able to manage most of these without any problems. Um, good, and and ideally, postponing four weeks would be great. But like you mentioned, lots of social factors and other things mean that you know, what is it? Children get six to ten or whatever upper respiratory infections yeah. a year, so you'll you'll rarely be in the the window of good opportunity. So again, there's no there's no point in delaying without systemic features. Uh, good. So let's say uh, the child has no concerning features and you want to crack on with this case. And how do you decide whether to pre-med the patient or not, this five-year-old? Um, so uh, in my pre-anesthetic assessment, I will be um, assessing the child and their sort of demeanor and uh, how relaxed they appear. Mm -hmm. um, and I will also take some degree of guidance from the parents. So this is a child who's had recurrent uh, general anesthetics, um, it's very likely that the parent will know uh, whether the child requires a pre-med and, and generally what was successful in the past. <laughs> if this is a child who has not previously had an anesthetic, uh, then I would base it purely upon, um, I suppose, my assessment of, of how relaxed the child is, as well as considering the risks of the pre-med in a child who's having a, a tonsillectomy for potentially for you know snoring or obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so let's say they've got no signs of obstructive sleep apnea or snoring, um, and you do want to give a pre-med, what do you give? What are your options and what, what is your preference? Um, so options for sort of a sedative pre-med would include midazolam at a dose of uh, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram orally. What's the um, max dose for that? Maximum dose of 20 milligrams. Sounds good. Keep going. Um, or uh, oral clonidine at a dose of three, three mics per kilo orally. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything else? I mean, put severe, sort of severely, um, you may consider a, a pre-med of ketamine if, if the child was um, non-compliant without IV access. Um, an IM sense. dose of ketamine, a dose of two, two milligrams per kilogram. Look, that's fair. <laughs> now, you, you're giving me the um, are you sure face? So are you oh, sure? <laughs> this is very much an are you sure face. I've not looked up the dose of ketamine for a while. Oh, that's right. How much would you give IV, by the way, for just a general patient? Of ketamine? Yeah. Um, for a induction dose? Yeah, yeah, for an adult. Uh, an adult would be sort of one to two, right? Yeah, exactly. And whenever I think intramuscular, I, I, I just double the one to two, four. so I'm thinking, yeah. So they've got a big range here, so four, three. Four, but I was like, God, that sounds like an awful lot. It, it does sound like an awful lot. And look, I've I've only done this once, uh, four milligrams per kilogram. I am large patient, uh, I think he's autistic or some kind of other disability um, or, you know, just really non-compliant. And it was, it's, it's horrendous to think that we need to do that for the child's safety to get that MRI done. But, you know, that's just what we need to do. And we, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big dose, um, no question about it. And even the oral dose is a real large range. So three to eight milligrams per kilogram orally. I don't think they've got the dose finding studies on this. You yeah. know? So, you, you, you know, you essentially, I think you had a good in, in, inclination of what dose for all of these medications. And the exam technique would to be to you know, obviously memorize these doses. But if you don't know the dose, you probably have a good in inclination that oh, I'd look it up, but I suspect it's around this the many milligrams per kilogram. Sure. So that maybe that's a technique. If you're not sure, you give a educated guess because you pro your, your guesses are most likely right. But throughout this whole viva, your gut feeling has been right the whole time. Yeah. So to say, look, I'm not exactly sure I'd look it up, but I suspect it's around this amount. Sure. Okay. That's, a, that's probably a good way of being confident. Uh, good. So you choose that. Um, good. Let's say... Operation, so this, um, what are we doing here? Tonsillectomy. Is it a tonsillectomy? Yes, that's right. Tonsillectomy, tonsillectomy that's right. <laughs> so many uh, reiterations. So many <laughs> the child wakes up and is hysterical. Uh, surgery's gone well, child wakes up and is hysterical, crying and screaming. Uh, what is going on? So I would, um, I would attend immediately if I wasn't already there. Um, I would attempt to put 
at a very minimum oxygen saturation probe on the on the child's foot whilst assessing that we've still got IV access. What is going on? Sorry, what do you think this is? Oh, sorry. So my main differential um, would be um, emergent delirium or um, or severe pain, but I would like to rule out something more sinister. Yeah, good. I like that framework. You know, this could just be pain, but right now uh, the, the patient looks like they've got emergent delirium. What is emergent delirium? Um, this is a phenomenon where um, whereby most commonly children of a, of a preschool and early school age um, can emerge from anesthesia um, in a delirious and sort of dissociated state. Hey, good. I, I, and that's a, you know, obviously you're trying to think of a definition on the fly here, and that's actually a really good definition. Emergent delirium is defined as disturbance in the child's awareness and or attention to his or her environment characterized by disorientation, hypersensitivity and hyperactive motor behavior in the immediate post anesthesia period. And I feel like your definition is fine. So that, you know, you're, you're getting most of the high points of that. Uh, good. I like the fact that you're ruling out other things, especially pain and sinister causes. Uh, what are your, what are your treatments for this? How do you, how do you address this after ruling out other causes? Um, my, my initial treatment would, um, be for the child to be comforted by the, a member of the team, perhaps a, a member of the nursing staff whilst, um, if possible, whilst I um, prepare um, drugs if, for, for sort of worst case scenario, mm -hmm. which I would um, utilize um, clonidine, mm -hmm. IV clonidine. Mm -hmm. um, Again, a, always offer doses if you can. In a dose of uh, one mic per kilo. Good. Again, you're questioning. I, <laughs> I want you to um, frame it in a way that you still can be reasonably unsure of what you're saying, but it sounds more confident. Yeah. Uh, so I would, um, this would be in a, 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 a approximate dose of one mic per kilo, but I would, um, I would seek further advice regarding that. Good. And, and, and you, you probably should know the clonidine dose. So the, that, that's right. I'll give one mic per kilo as well. That, I normally I, use I normally use uh, propofol, so I don't know why I decided on this occasion I was just going to come out with clonidine. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Okay, I, yeah. In my experience, <laughs> I've used propofol in this situation. Good. You're always allowed to go, hey, actually, I reassess. I'd use propofol. That's what I normally use. Yeah. So how much propofol? I'm, I'm more comfortable with propofol, how it will, how the child yes. will respond and what to expect. Yeah, it's a lot quicker and you can manage it, right? Yeah. Um, how much propofol would you get then? Always voluntary yeah. in doses. So I would start with a milligram per kilogram. Sounds good. On reassess. Uh, that's all fine. Look, we're going to keep going with this. Uh, so the, the, the last situation this poor child finds uh, themselves in is that five days later, you're called to the emergency department. And would you guess that the tonsillectomy patient you just had is having a post-op bleed? Now, first of all, what are the reasons for post-tonsillectomy bleed? Uh, so this could be secondary to um, sort of surgical site ooze. So, um, inadequate sort of cauterization of the tonsillar bed um, that's been slowly trickling. It could be dislodgement of a clot that has been sat there um, or could be a, a coagulopathy potentially. Maybe. Um, it could also be infection, like say five days later, you know, delayed hemorrhage, often infection, but yeah, reactionary hemorrhage. So the actual surgical site, that's usually within 24 hours and far more far worse than to, you know, infective cause of a post-op bleed. Um, let's say, so you'd go down to see this patient. What is your approach for this patient if you were to manage it? So the con my concerns when I'm uh, on my way to assess this patient are um, the patient's uh, blood, amount of blood loss and the patient's volume status, mm -hmm. um, the status of their IV access, Mm -hmm. um, I'm also concerned that there are going to be a, a young, distressed child with a, a likely anxious parent, mm -hmm. and then un, unfasted, they may have a, a belly full of blood, and they may have a difficult airway. My, sorry, I didn't really, I didn't necessarily answer the question there. No, no, no that's I, good. You, you highlighted all the problems that I would say as well. So just to reiterate, patients hypovolemic, potentially in shock difficult airway in a remote environment, unfasted, agitated, distressed parent. These are all kind of the high points of what makes this situation specifically challenging aside from every other situation of a pediatric case. So I think you highlighted that really well. Um, great, so what do you do for your induction? The 
uh, I would endeavour to, to obtain IV access prior to my induction for this child, yep. um, acknowledging that this is not going to be easy, um, but that okay. it will allow it will allow me to secure the airway rapidly with a rapid sequence induction, mm -hmm. and will also allow me to administer IV fluid resuscitation prior to induction. Sounds good. You get the IV access, you resuscitate with 20 mils per kilo of normal saline. Keep going. Um, I would, um, in this scenario, if required, I would have the, the mother in the room mm -hmm. um, as the child is li highly likely to be um, agitated. I would apply standard ANSCA monitoring mm -hmm. um, at, at a minimum, um, a SATS probe and a blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. um, I would pre-oxygenate the child um, as, as best as best I could with two suctions available mm -hmm. with Ian, ENT surgeon um, on standby mm -hmm. uh, and a second pair of anesthetic hands in the room as well as a well-trained nurse available. Mm -hmm. um, I would use um, fentanyl at a dose of one mic per kilo um, and I would actually titrate propofol to eye closure mm -hmm. starting with a dose of two milligrams per kilogram. Um, do, you, um, do you use cricoid for this? In this particular case, although they're acknowledging that there is a risk of um, aspiration of blood from the stomach, I would not use cricoid um, because um, this is already likely to be a difficult airway mm. and it may further obscure my view. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, cricoid is one of those things. There's no evidence of actual benefit and there's lots of evidence of di di making the airway more difficult. So I think that's really reasonable. I, I like your approach to that. So essentially all standards, all standard monitoring, but you gave a lot of practical tips that say junior and this wouldn't know about two suction devices because one can easily get blocked with a clot. So you always have one spare and that's a very specific thing that we would all do for this kind of case. Having the parent there, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Pre-option as best as you can. Um, uh, and uh, you know, things like the video laryngoscope and your formula of you know giving your fentanyl propofol, uh, which relaxant were you going to give? Sorry, uh, I would suck some methionine a dose of two milligrams per kilogram. Yes, yeah, sounds I, good. Yeah, um, may I ask at this point, Lahiru? Yeah. Um, th this is a case where I really wouldn't want the parent in the room, but uh, sort of acknowledging the fact that this child is going to be sort of potentially quite distressed. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like I would want the patient, the parent in the room. I think it's a very difficult situation that there's probably a good spectrum of what people would want. But at five years of age, the, touch, the child's probably terrified. Yeah. And having the parent then knowing that the parent, you know, I, like obviously the patient, the parent is super anxious, unreasonable. Then, it, you know, if they're going to detract from the situation, that's fine. But I've, I've very rarely found parents to detract. You know, as soon as I say, yep, thanks very much. We'll take care of them. We'll see you out. The, and the technician escorts them out. That's that always works for me. So I guess I've, I don't think I've performed a rapid sequence induction with a parent present. You've obviously got a slightly smaller window. Yeah, yeah. Move them. Um, <laughs> I mean, you still have thirty seconds till the muscle relaxant works. Okay, sure. I just go. You know, don't worry about the hey, give your child a kiss or anything. Just, just say okay, thanks very much, confidently yeah. with a smile. We'll take good care of them, and then out, out of the room. I mean, okay. there's there's only one time where the patient where the, the parent has just stayed with the child yeah. and I'm like thank you very much thanks very much yeah. thanks very much and you know it's, it's for the obviously it's for the patient's benefit now to keep going with this so you induce you use the video lingoscope there's blood everywhere you're unable to get an airway you can't seem to find the airway you can't pass the tube what do you do so um I would return to, I would acknowledge in the risk of potential aspiration. Um, mm. I would return to bag mask ventilate the patient in order to maintain oxygenation. You're not um, getting much rise and fall of the chest with bag mask ventilation. What okay, so at this point we're in the, in the vortex. So mm. we, we're not able to uh, oxygenate this patient or ventilate this patient. Mm. I would um, take further measures to optimize my bag mask ventilation, including use of an oropharyngeal airway, mm. repositioning the child, um, suctioning the airway and potentially uh, inserting a nasopharyngeal airway as well. Okay. Um, with two mask ventilation and my assistant squeezing the bag. Great. No ventilation occurs. Uh, I will also ensure that the patient is, is adequately paralyzed. I'll ensure that I've given definitely given my sucks. Um, yep. So we, we've we've failed at all all options at, um, at face mask ventilation. Um, I would potentially ask um, a colleague 
to do a second laryngoscopy. So I, I've had a couple of goes, but it's worth perhaps one additional person taking a look. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, alternatively, I could try to ventilate with um, a, a laryngeal mask with Fantastic. being aware that at this point we're heading towards a can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario. And we may need to proceed to front of neck access. Fantastic. Why did you say uh, a colleague has just one more look? What was that about? Um, so I um, haven't sort of refreshed these guidelines, but um, my understanding from sort of the DAS guidance is sort of a maximum of, of three attempts of Why? intubation. Um, because any further attempts um, is, is potentially going to worsen airway trauma and edema with little benefit. But I think a second person looking is is reasonable yeah that's uh, that's absolutely right the way you get from a difficult airway to an impossible airway is repeated trauma to the airway which means repeated laryngoscopy into that vallecula or around that area swelling and then you know, as, as you know it, things become a lot worse look I, I really like that answer one of the best things about that answer was that first of all you when, when i give this this situation to people they often forget the lma because it's it, it seems like nothing's going to work they've all in their heads they've probably tried everything and they go straight for the neck or for the uh, front of neck access. But the fact that you triggered that memory by saying, look, this is, I'll, I'll use the vortex approach or we're, we're in the vortex means that now you've triggered in your mind, the fact that you've got to mention optimization of bag mask, intubation and LMA. So that's just gone, gone out, like come out straight away, which is really great. Not, so not only have you then triggered that in your mind and, you, and for you to express that, but then you've said, you know, in worst case scenario, this will go to front of neck access. So I'd have someone preparing that as well. So you've anticipated, the full story of what I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I'm asking about a difficult airway and without me prompting, you've just told me the full story very quickly, very efficiently. So if exam technique wise, you're getting the, your words out quickly. And, you know, I'm satisfied that you know all the, all the steps to where this can progress in the worst case scenario. So uh, that was really good. <laughs> that's, that's the end of the vibe, Joe. So how do Thank you feel? Um, I don't, I feel actually relatively all right with regards to my structure. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of stuff that I need to brush up on because I've not looked at some of this stuff for six months now. Um, yes. There's very little I need to add with your structure. So that's really good. Okay. So you know, yeah. whatever people have been telling you, you're saturated with structures, but great. Your structures are spot on, I feel. Like the only times I was prompting you with information was it was actually just information, like sp- very specific information. I don't think these are pass fail things. These are probably, you know, getting to the level of you, you know, you've done lots of reading now, you've got all the knowledge at your disposal, but I feel like these aren't pass fail things. And even when you didn't know specific knowledge, you knew roughly what it was. So your gut feeling through your experience is, is right. I so, guess what I am trying to start to do is pretend that I'm having a slightly more casual conversation um, yeah. because I think uh, I've done a few vibes where I've, I've almost tried to play the game too much and I've sounded perhaps a bit stilted. Okay. Oh, the way you I'm sound trying so now to talk a bit more like you're just asking me casually yeah. so that yeah. I don't uh, try as hard or something. Well, whatever you're doing, it, it's it's fine. Like your manner is okay. Thanks, manner is perfect. So that was, that was really good. Obviously, we went just for the audience. We went through a lot of things. I'm trying to jam pack as much into these situations. I call these pedi- pediatric worst case scenarios because essentially this poor patient has everything bad happen to them, except for having an arrest. So uh, we went through ne- neonate pilot stenosis, heart murmur, uh, and upper respiratory upper respiratory tract infection for tonsillectomy. Uh, what you do in a pre-med? How do you manage emergency delirium? Um, the bleeding tonsil that presents back into ED and then kind of difficult airway as well. So. That was, yeah. a bit, that was pretty full on. That's pretty full on. That's yeah. been 54 minutes of me examining you, so uh, yeah. good on you. Um, uh, Joe, you did really well. Are you, are you happy for me to contact you in a couple of weeks and we can do this again? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, look, I think the audience really appreciates just this exposure to what we go through for this exam, but also, you know, real specialist knowledge that we're talking about. Because I, I feel like it takes so much to get you to where you are now to be able to answer these questions like that. So well done. Thanks very much. Um, All right. So that's all for today. Thanks very much for listening and watching. Um, Again, if you have any questions or comments, abcs of anesthesia at gmail.com or just write in the comments below if if on YouTube. And yeah, definitely happy for any feedback. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks.